Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Um, welcome to what I'm calling Scientology Live. Um, tonight, um, we're going to be uh, doing, uh, basically I'm just going to do a live uh, stream and then at the end, I will do Q&A. And if you want to uh, ask a question or you want to get a comment in or a super chat or any of that stuff, um, do it before I start answering um, the questions or reading the super chats. And once I start reading them, then don't put in any anymore because I'm not – otherwise, you guys will just – you guys keep me <laughs> endlessly and I can, um, I can never get out. So, um, so once I start answering those, we're going to – that's going to be the cutoff. Um, and then, yeah, we have, oh my God, I've got some crazy news about this uh, spy files to tell you um, at the end of the video as well. And um, yeah, so that's what we got. Um, the topic of tonight's video is Scientology and the police and how basically they get cozy with all these police um, all over, not just in the United States, in, in foreign countries and, and all over, uh, not just California and Florida, but basically anywhere that Scientology operates. And um, the way that I am familiar with this is that at the international base, um, we were basically privy to a lot of different information. But um, one of the things people keep asking is how are uh, Scientology, you hear about all these Scientology crimes that are happening all over the world and, um, and assaults that are taking place in California, um, crimes that are taking place in Florida. And it's kind of mind boggling, like why Scientology aren't getting lit up more or why they're not getting in trouble or how are these things never getting heard about or seen? And there's two... There's two kinds of crimes that happen in Scientology. Um, and basically, you have Scientology on Scientology crimes. And um, I'm going to do a I'm going to do a video on a massive, massive one of those. But basically, that's where si some Scientologist screws over another Scientologist and then um, Scientology, the way Scientology's internal justice system is basically organized is that it's a crime for a Scientologist to report another Scientologist to law enforcement. So if you basically have, if you have a Scientologist that commits a crime and another Scientologist is either the victim of it or um, in some way, other Scientologists get damaged. Scientologists are sort of obligated to resolve that internally and not go to law enforcement or to the justice system to get that fixed. And that um, also involves the Scientology organization. So when the Scientology organization or somebody who works for Scientology or the C organization, when they commit a crime or they know of a crime, it all gets handled internally, okay? So why do police need to be cozied up to? Well, sometimes those things happen and it spills out of the Scientology world. And that is where um, Scientology basically needs to do what's called safe pointing. And wherever they operate, wherever they have a base or a Sea Org base or an organization, um, they basically try to get cozy with anybody in the local um, government there, local law enforcement. This involves just like city police, state police, um, as many people and politicians and law enforcement that they can kind of get into the pockets of. Um, then they're going to do that as much as possible so that when anything goes sideways, they've got somebody on speed dial that they can talk to. Now, I just, um, I've got some notes here. I just want to make sure I've, I've got these here so that I don't go, uh, I don't go too off the, uh, off the topic here. But, um, one of the ways, um, Scientology can get their, um, get their clutches or get their, get into the pockets of, of these law enforcement agencies is, um, they have these things called events. Now, an event is basically like a Scientology convention of sorts. And, um, and they have several of these throughout the year. And the, the best way I can compare it 
is um well i'll explain to you what the events are and then i'll kind of then you can get an idea um what you know what that would be like in each place and you'll see how this ties into the police as well so there is a whole chapter about these events in my book blown for good behind the iron curtain of scientology but i'll basically run through them you know pretty quickly right here the first event that they have um each year now these are events that take place every single year in scientology so the first event is called the new year's event and the new year's event normally um, happens at the shrine auditorium uh ruth eckert hall in um, florida and i think it's in uh i want to say it's in like tampa and then um, I think it's near the Bucks Stadium. And then they have, um, they also have had it at the Fort Harrison Auditorium, um, which is in Clearwater at their huge Scientology compound there. And um, this New Year's event really just goes over, it celebrates any um, supposed expansion or news that's happened in Scientology internationally um, in the past year. And they celebrate that at the New Year's event. And David Miscavige is the one who puts on this event. David Miscavige puts on all the events, but they used to kind of be a, a group of guys. And now David Miscavige is the one who presides, is the MC. He might have a speaker or two come up, but he pretty much is the event at each one of these things. Um, uh, okay, so that's the New Year's event. And that usually takes place on New Year's or around New Year's. And then um, each of these events is videoed and then shown in Scientology organizations around the world, usually the following weekend. And in the in the old days, we used to do a satellite transmission. So it was happening live in one location and then it was being simulcast everywhere else. So like maybe having it live in Florida and then after um, the event was over in Florida, we would rush to the satellite company, and then we would beam it out to all the other organizations around the world. That's mainly just for New Year's because it's a critical timing event. Okay, the next event is, so we got January, New Year's. Okay, the next one is March 13th. The March 13th is the L. Ron Hubbard birthday event. And that is the event where they celebrate L. Ron Hubbard's birthday. And L. Ron Hubbard uh, said, don't give me a tie or a cake, but I want you to give me um, expansion um, across the, um, you know, all of Scientology. And that's where basically all Scientology organizations internationally um, compete against each other weekly. And they basically... Um, they whatever their statistics are, um, they play this game against each other and there's weekly uh, uh, standings and quarterly standings. And then whoever has the most points at the end of the year, they win the birthday game for their kind of uh, class or size of organization. And um, they get a trophy and woo everybody gets excited about the project. They have some cake. And then Scientology uses uses this as a fundraising activity for all of the Scientologists excuse me, that attend the event. And they do this for all of these events are essentially giant fundraising activities so they can get as much money out as, of, as, out of as many members as possible um, at each one of these events. Okay, so that's March 13th. Um, the, and that takes place, um, that has taken place historically at um, the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles. It happens at the uh, Ruth Eckert Hall or at the Flag Auditorium. The next event is called the May 9th event. And the May 9th event is a celebration of the original publication of the book by L. Ron Hubbard, Dianetics, and that took place in 1950. And this event really just celebrates Dianetics auditors and um and dianetic co-auditing and people who are getting the book and where the what book the the what country the book has been translated into recently and published and there's an audio version and a video version and all these other different iterations of dianetics and that event also would normally take place in florida at the ruth eckert hall or the flag auditorium and in some years it had also taken place at the shrine auditorium in los angeles Okay, now the next um, event is called the June 6th event, but it actually is a week-long series 
event that takes place in the Caribbean. And each night it has a different theme, like they'll do uh, front groups. They'll celebrate a different front group each night of the week. And one week they'll do uh, WISE, which is the World Institute of Scientology Enterprises, like the Scientology kind of business world. And then they'll have uh, one night might be um, ABLE, which is the Association for Better Living and Education. That's the C organization that runs Narconon, Criminon, Applied Scholastics, and the Way to Happiness. And so they might have one night where they talk about any one or all of those activities and what they're doing. And, um, and then they might have one on the preservation of the technology, which is CST, the Church of Spiritual Technology, where they put all of Hubbard's writings and um, recordings on gold plates and etched into stainless steel plates as writings and seal them in titanium capsules with argon gas and put them in bunkers in the side of mountains. And, um, and so then they'll, and then they'll do, so they'll do a week long of these. And this is attended by the, the richest Scientologists in the world. And also I think in order to be on this, to attend these events, you have to be either um, OT level seven or eight, or have just given them in an insane amount of money. That's how you get into this. It's like a, uh, it's like a members only series of events. And again, this is another, uh, opportunity where they suck a ton of dough out of these people. And these are mostly the whales quote unquote in Scientology. So the you, millions and millions of dollars they've already given to Scientology just to get to the OT level seven or eight. And then they could also be, you know, successful business people that just give them lots of money. And then what they do for this event is they then they video and they video all of these events, but then they make individual events out of each night and then they replay those usually in all organizations around the world. But they might do like a sort of like a festival style or street style event in Los Angeles or Florida each week um, for during the summer to get people in use it as getting people into their local organizations as a fundraising uh, opportunity. And that is, and that event takes a board that those events, the, uh, the live events, the original events take place at the free winds cruise ship in the Caribbean. And, um, and that's like usually Curacao, Bonaire, and Aruba, the ABCs, they kind of zip zippity doo dah around those three islands for that week of events. Okay, this is gonna oh, this will tie in with the police in the end here. Um, the next event, and then this one is a huge one, um, internationally, but it takes place in Los Angeles, and that is the Celebrity Center Gala, and that takes place at the Celebrity Center in Hollywood. And they use this event as basically an, um, they, it's an event that David Miscavige hosts and they invite law enforcement, uh, law enforcement, dignitaries, politicians, um, Hollywood celebrities that aren't in Scientology, agents, uh, professionals in the industry. They basically use as, as an attempt, uh, an attempt to recruit celebrities into Scientology or safe point them or create allies with celebrities or these politicians or law enforcement or first responders or whatever it is. And really, um, it's a way for Scientology to say, hey, if you come to our event, um, you might, uh, your wife might end up getting a dance with John Travolta. You might end up getting a picture with a, you know, a, an attractive uh, celebrity Scientology actress or TV star or, you know, any of those such, those such type of activities. Schmoo it's a, it's a schmooze fest, basically a Scientology schmooze fest. They invite these people and they wine them and dine them and uh, schmooze and, you know, maybe they get a few people in their pockets that way. And that is in uh, that takes it's in the summer. I don't remember the exact date of this one, um, but uh, you know that's where your John Travolta's and your Danny Mastersons and your uh, Jenna Elfman's and uh, you know Kirsty and Lisa in the past, um, rest in peace. And um, those type of celebrities, any Scientology celebrities or profession, uh, successful professionals, 
will attend this event. It's also a way for wealthy Scientologists that might not necessarily get to schmooze with these people. Sometimes if they've given millions, they can get into like Grant Cardone's probably been to a, uh, a few celebrity uh, center galas. Um, and that is most definitely presided over by David Miscavige. Okay, then the next event is Auditor's Day. And Auditor's Day takes place in September. And this event is basically to celebrate the Scientology counselor. And this is almost uh, exclusively held in Florida, either at the uh, Fort Harrison Auditorium um, or Ruth Eckert Hall. And sometimes it also has been held at the Shrine Auditorium. Um, and as well, it is presided over by David Miscavige. In most instances, sometimes this one could be presided over another lesser Scientology executive. If there's not, if it's not going to be a good event, like there wasn't a lot of, there's nothing to celebrate, then this is one of the events that sort of is like the um, uh, sacrificial lamb event. Like if we don't really got anything for this one, then it's like, this one, it's out. We're not going to do it. It's Or Dave won't do it. They'll just have a ceremony for the, like all organizations will just have some sort of local event to celebrate their counselors, the counselor who audited or did the most counseling hours in the year. Um, and if it's going to be an international event that Dave's going to preside over, then the, all of those auditors are all competing against each other. And the top auditor of different levels or classes would be awarded, um, and I think it's called the Auditor of the Year Award. Um, and um, again, that usually would take place in Florida and sometimes at the Shrine. Okay, then the one, one the last major event is the IAS event, and that event is for the uh, International Association of Scientologists that occurs in uh, East near East Grinstead, Sussex, England, and that is really. Um, it's another one of these fundraising events, but for the most wealthy Scientologists to travel from wherever they live in the world, they will travel to this event, but it is really an opportunity to get European, um, or Scientologists in that part of the world that wouldn't necessarily want or be able to travel to the United States to be able to, um, basically get get uh, fundraised out of. So they use this as sort of a uh, major European um, or that area of the country uh, opportunity to get money out of those folks. And this event um, is also videoed and then broadcast everywhere. And again, this this usually, it used to kind of move around. It, one year it'd be in England, then it would be in Denmark, and then it would be, and then they sort of just decided, we, stop, we're not going to move this thing around anymore. We're just always going to have it at um, this giant estate they have in England called St. Hill. And um, and that is, a, it's a, also a place where L. Ron Hubbard used to, like, kind of made the original big Scientology organization. And then, um, and then the last type of event they have are these ideal opening org opening events that David, whenever David Miscavige, uh, spends a ton of money on a brand new building, they don't need, or they can't fill, or they're never going to use. Um, they have a big opening and ribbon cutting for that. And he is the one who opens it because this is all his idea. And he's the one who created all these. And, um, so he will go and he will open it this year. They're supposed to, I think they're supposed to do like three or four of these ideal opening events. And that could be anywhere. It could be in London, could be in Madrid, could be in uh, Wichita, could be in Minnesota, could be anywhere. They're going to open one of these, take an old organization and renovate it or buy a brand new historic or a historic building and uh, put all new furniture in it and make it all nice. Um, that could be one of those. So you get, so that's seven events a year, six or seven events a year that you're going to do no matter what, and then throw in another few organiz, uh, ideal orgs. So let's say maybe 10 events a year that Scientology does, or they want to do, they strive to do every single year. Okay. So what does this have to do with the police? Like who cares? Well, each one of these events is like it's like it's a it's like the Oscars in Scientology. So red carpet, limos, 
Um, everybody's wearing, uh, you know, like dressing up women are wearing gowns or, uh, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a black tie sort of thing. Um, and to get in, it's like, you got, everybody's got to go. But, um, if you are a Scientologist and you don't show up, that's kind of like, Hmm, you know, Joe didn't come to the event. He didn't come to the last event either. And it's sort of like a tally, like it's a muster of Scientologist. And if you don't show up, you, you don't have to show up to every single one, but if you don't show up to a few a year, it's sort of like, Hmm, that's a good indicator that Joe might be going astray. So they use it as a fundraising raising tool and also to kind of keep the temperature on their folks and where they're at in terms of Scientology. So there's a lot of people going to these things and they're like a nice event and they don't want, um, they don't want SPs showing up. They don't want suppressive persons, people like me, people like Mike Rinder, Aaron Smith Levin. They do not want us to show up at these things. And so there's a very, very heavy OSA presence at every single one of these events. There's usually an OSA team that's there. And what they do is whenever there's one of these events, they hire a ton of private security. And 95% of that private security are police officers, off-duty police officers. And they will hire them for the entire day, at least several hours of the day. In most cases, it's a whole day. And they're paying these guys. I don't know how much it is in the outside of the United States, but I know, I know I've hired them myself when we did film shoots in Los Angeles. Oh, that's another thing. Whenever we did film shoots, we'd hire these guys as well. But um, we're paying these guys around $75 an hour. They're expected to do little to nothing. They just sit there in their squad car that they bring as part of it. This is organized through the, de the police department. It's an official, it's an official thing that Scientology set up with the local police department or the state police or wherever they're doing these events. So you have basically um, anywhere from, let's say five to depending on the size of the event, it could be 30, maybe even 50 police officers that are behind, that are hired. Like they, they'd have events at the shrine where you'd have two or three police at each corner of each intersection around the uh, shrine auditorium. So you could easily have 25 police just standing there on the corners with their motorcycle or their squad car just sitting there and in, in full uniform, in full police uniform. And so if any SP or anything um, that Scientology, a protester, somebody screaming, oh, Zeno's my homeboy, Baba Booey, you know, any of that stuff, um, they will be like, hey, you got to deal with that. And then the police will, whoop, whoop, you know, roll up on them and, hey, what are you doing? Da, 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 da. And if there's any sort of like, oh, this guy threatened you know, they'll make and they'll make up whatever story too. like, oh, we know. And that's another thing. OSA is at the event and um, they have what's called the rogues gallery. It is a picture. <laughs> this is the craziest thing. It's like a photo album of every single SP that exists in that area. And then the major SPs that could just, you know, uh, kamikaze this thing. So, you know, Mike Rinder's in there. I'm in there. Um, and then depending on what where the event is there'd be all the sps that are like local to that area the suppressive persons that used to be in scientology or that have attacked scientology in that area osa has looked at this thing and played like the memory game so they can look at all these faces so that if they see somebody they can go like oh that's my grinder and then they can you know pounce and or get the police to they'll trespass him and say hey police you got to take him uh, we need to you need to trespass this guy and get him off the property so, um, but now here's the thing, wherever they're doing like a local ideal org opening, they'll hire these police and they don't really have that many Scientologists where this ideal org opening is necessarily, but they will have now, um, oh, and the people who hire the police is OSA. So the office of special affairs, they're the ones that are, um, the Dirty Tricks Department of Scientology. They're the spy organization for Scientology. And they're the ones 
that liaise with that local government, the mayor. Oh, and when they do the ideal org openings, usually they'll have the mayor or some local county supervisor or some muckety muck or you know government spokes hole for that little spot to be a speaker at their event so they get the that person they get all the police and now osa's basically got all the contacts and all the safe points they need for that organization but when they're doing these events in florida and la you're talking about police that are getting paid hundreds if not thousands of dollars multiple times a year and a ton of them so you might have in the hollywood in lapd and the hollywood division you might have um police that are um earning tens of thousands of dollars a year from scientology that's a boat payment that's a family vacation that's a that's a cabin somewhere that's a, a you know that is a that's a significant amount of money for many 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 officers to be getting from scientology and most of those areas where they're doing that is where they have a large concentration of scientologists so and they've been doing this since the 80s, since the 1980s. And so you have these police that are going there and they're going every single few months and they're doing one of these gigs and they're getting the money and they're talking to the OSA guys. And the, the OSA guys know all of these police by first name basis. They know, oh, that's Sergeant this and that's Officer this. And, and so then you even see where Scientology, if they don't, if they have a police that they're not friendly with that guy doesn't do these events the 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 science the the police or the law enforcement or the politicians that are cozying up with scientology they're the ones that are getting invited to the celebrity center gala they're the ones that are being picked the sergeants are being picked like you can be the shift or like i don't know how they i don't know what they call it but it's like the 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 guy who's going to have his guys be the private security so you pick this guy and then he cherry picks the officers that he wants to come and those are all the officers that are sort of friendly to scientology and they know the drill and they know osa is going to run the scene and if we need to you know drive the the osa guys around the block or um, you know, we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on a few individuals that look a little sus. You know, the police are very, very willing to work with OSA and do whatever they want because OSA's writing these checks. And so, and the other crazy thing about this is that um, a lot of law enforcement or, or, or police officers, when they retire from the force, they either go into, um, a lot of them, are it's a common thing for them to either go into private security or private investigator so they're either basically like a bodyguard or sort of just kind of like a you know a stand there and and look tough guy or they're actually going to be a private investigator and since Scientology they've been getting this paycheck from Scientology for so many years that it's a no-brainer and they get cozy to Osa and Osa be like hey you know when you retire give us a call you know we'll hook you up we 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 use a lot of private investigators all over the world and they pay very very good and so you say like okay Okay, it's there's nothing illegal about any of this. But when a girl goes in to the Hollywood division in LAPD and she's been assaulted by a celebrity, a, a Scientology celebrity, uh, Scientology is getting a phone call um, the second they find out this is in any way connected to Scientology. And then the other thing I was going to say is that when these Scientology guys uh when they the police do leave the force and then they become private investigators um who do these guys who do these private investigators now that they've hired know they know all the police in that division or that department that they worked in so when this girl goes in and she says hey this happened the police don't have to call scientology but they can call uh, Sergeant Bloody Blah, who's now a, a, a private investigator, is now a PI that the force knows works for Scientology. So they're not really calling Scientology. They're calling Sergeant Bloody Blah, and Sergeant Bloody Blah is on the phone with Osa going, okay, I got a problem. Uh, the desk sergeant just, uh, this girl just came in. This is what happened. Um, it's, 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 it's all old boys club. 
Everyone's getting the palms are all getting greased everywhere. And that's how they're making these things disappear. And that's how they're that's how they're able to get away with more shit than you would ever believe of because they've already given, they've already been paying these guys for decades in most cases and mainly in Florida and in Los Angeles but in a lot of places they've got in England they've got a guy and he knows all the guys and they pay him and they do this in every place where they have a presence that they need to have somebody basically in their pocket in case shit goes sideways. And you say, well, how much is that? There's two ways I know I, I can monet, put a, like a, a number on this. And that is there was a story that came out in the media a few years ago about Scientology paying two individual private investigators $500,000 a year for I think it was like 12 years. I think they paid like 10 or 12 million dollars to these to two dudes, two private investigators. And these two private investigators were watching one dude, one guy. That one guy was his name was Pat Broker. He was the guy that David Miscavige basically stole Scientology control from and told him basically blackmailed him and said if you don't if you don't let me do what I'm doing I'm going to call the FBI and I know you're taking um you're taking uh you've taken large amounts of cash across state lines for Hubbard from Hubbard whatever and broker went off and Dave Miscavige didn't know if broker was going to keep his mouth shut or if he was going to spill the beans so he put these two dudes on him and he paid them $500,000 a year that's two dudes Okay, so that's one way I know how much they're spending on PIs. The other way is that when I was at the international headquarters, um, I was on a, a committee of sorts that was called the International Financial Planning, uh, or INTFP. And basically, it was sort of like the Scientology allowance for all the different a uh, areas of Scientology. And it, was, it happened every week. And so... I was there to get the like the film and video production money. So I would go and say, hey, I need, you know, I need 150K or I need 80K or whatever it was that week. And, um, and everybody would basically put in what their budget for the week. And depending on who needed what, some of my stuff would get cut or some of this guy's stuff got, would get cut or the magazine money would get cut and they'd kind of balance it all out. But every single week, the Office of Special Affairs would get a cut and some weeks they get 500k some weeks they get 700k some some weeks they get 200k but i don't ever in the entire i mean i did this for many years i don't ever remember a week where they got under a hundred thousand dollars a week okay and that's for lawyers and pis and um whatever osa spends money on police for these things um oh and that's another thing for these events that money doesn't come out of that um for when we have these events that money's not coming out of osa's bucket of money that amount of money is usually coming out of the event uh the event production bucket of money so that money for all the police the individual like the 75 dollar an hour guys that money's coming out of um, a totally separate bucket than the 100k a week osa bucket so that is so no matter what osa is spending millions and millions of dollars on private investigators which are in most cases are former police and on police officers active police now that are off duty working for scientology as security guards and so that is how Scientology is getting away with this. I mean, even in Los Angeles, there's a there's a guy. He's a he's since been disgraced for all kinds of nonsense. But um, his name is Lee Baca. You can Google this dude. You just say Lee Baca, B A C A L E E B A C A. Lee Baca Scientology. This guy has appeared in more official Scientology photographs than a lot of individual Scientologists have. I mean, this guy. He's I mean, I could, you could search right now. You could probably find five pictures of him and David Miscavige <laughs> and then him and other, a ton of other Scientology people at the celebrity center 
Gala or the Hollywood Christmas Parade or at a Scientology Los Angeles Ideal Org opening, you name it. This dude was in their pocket, like full on, no question. And LAPD is the same way with Celebrity Center. Celebrity Center has got LAPD wrapped around their fingers. And it's because of all this money that that changes hands between Scientology and the local law enforcement. And now this, I know this video is a little long here, guys, but like, I'm not, um, I'm probably not the guy that should be doing this. This story shouldn't be on my YouTube channel. This story should be on the fucking news or like, uh, they should be on some sort of fucking program. Like, um, that is like an, and like an investigate, like a vice story or, uh, What's that dude on uh, HBO? Uh, uh, John Oliver. Like, where the fuck is John Oliver? This is like his. This is his. This is his wheelhouse. This this kind of stuff. But um, but yeah, this is the kind of stuff that's going on, and everybody knows this is going on. It's not a secret. They've been doing this for decades. It's totally legal, quote unquote, and it's basically a way that Scientology it gets the upper hand when. Um, when one of their people falls out of line and does some illegal shit, um, they've got it set up so they get like a they get as much of a get out of jail free card as they possibly can in most instances. They've got it sitting there. It doesn't always work out that way for them, and we're going to talk about that in this other. I'm going to do another video. Um, that covers the Scientology on Scientology crime. And I'm going to tell you one that's going to blow your mind. I mean, there's people involved in this thing that you would never have guessed in a million years that Scientology basically stole millions and millions and millions of dollars from. Um, Not only Scientologists, uh, people that weren't, famous people that weren't Scientologists got ripped off. And, um, And one dude got in trouble. One guy. Everybody else got away scot free, even though Scientology in the end probably ended up making the the most money out of everybody. Um, they weren't involved at all for the most part. I mean, they they had to pay some money, but I'll, we'll do a whole video about that. But it's basically it's insane. Um, but yeah, maybe one day. I mean, I don't know if there's a way. Like, if you're basically, it's like the mafia. It, it that's exactly what it is. It's like the mafia. Um, having police be security for their for their personal events, and so when the mafia does some dumb shit, the police are like, "Meh, you know, uh, okay, yeah, we'll we'll sort it out." It it they're they're already they they no that guy that officer showing up or that officer that's seeing this poor girl that's come in, he's thinking about his goddamn boat or his his vacation. <laughs> He's not thinking about this poor girl because he knows if he doesn't do the right thing, he ain't going to be on the events anymore. He ain't going to be sitting on his bike, getting that paycheck for eating their food and sitting there and shooting the shit with his buddy for the whole day. And that shouldn't be a thing where you have to decide over your personal um, enhancement over the safety of this person. So anyway, that's how Scientology have corrupted law enforcement that's it there's there's other ways like just giving them shit like uh, the celebrity center thing where they give them money um they just donate to their charity or they invite them to schmooze with the celebs but i think this is the most major influence over law enforcement that scientology has or one of the most major uh influences they have and how they control law enforcement and keep this a lot of these things under wraps okay it is 640. If you have a question or a super chat and you got it in there, then um, we're going to do it now. I'm going to pull this up here. I'm looking over here. Okay. I'm going to see there's, there's uh, Claire is in here because there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of questions uh, starred. So uh, let's do it. If it, it right now it's saying it is, yeah, it's 6:40. So, I'm um, or 6:39. After 6:45, I'm not answering any of those questions. So, if you're going to do a super chat, don't do it after 6:45. Um whatever time, it's 6 almost 6:40 now. So, in the next 5 minutes, you can do whatever you want in there, but then after that, we're cutting it off. 
Okay, here we go. Um, Denver Stevio. Hey, frequent flyer, Denver. Uh, 10 bucks for Mark's awesome channel just because. Thank you, Denver. Also, if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. If you haven't hit the like button, hit the like button. Um, I was thinking about doing the video on the Scientology on Scientology crime. And then uh, somehow I was starting to think about it. I was like, oh, I should do the police one. But the the Scientology on Scientology crime one that I'm going to do is amazing. And when that comes out, you're going to want to hear about it. I think that one might even end up like making the rounds, might get popular on Twitter or some other sites might pick it up because there's a lot of current people that are hot in the entertainment industry today. Like some of the people that are on or part of the some of the the most like the top TV shows right now are involved in this Scientology on Scientology crime. And they're people that you have no idea about. So that one's gonna be pretty amazing. So if you put on the subscribe button and the bell notification icon, you're gonna find out when that thing hits the deck. And um, and hopefully I can do it pretty soon here. We had a snow day today, so I was like, we're gonna do a live tonight. That's all there is to it. Okay, next one. I didn't report something to police until after I left and after statute of limitations, because even if I was okay with it, with SP. I didn't want to have a family disconnect. Yeah, that's right. That's another thing. So in addition to the, um, we, you got to resolve it locally or you got to resolve it internally in Scientology. There's also the thing of, if you do report it, like, let's just say you're like, screw you, I'm reporting it. You're very likely going to lose contact with your family, your businesses or any business acquaintances or Anyone that's in Scientology, they're gonna, you're going to get in trouble with them and you might get cut off. So that's another reason why Scientologists um, don't ever even end up talking to law enforcement in the first place. Okay, Wendy, Wendy Gomes says, is safe pointing a synonym for bribery? <laughs> Basically, I mean, you had, I'll tell you, they safe pointed... Um, <sighs> mayor candidate in Los Angeles, um, Karen Bass, they safe pointed her and, um, they got her somehow they, they bamboozled her. And then she spoke at one of their events and they were like, yippee, yippee, ki -yay. We got her. Um, this is great for us, blah, 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 blah. And she wasn't the mayor. She was doing something else. And then when she found out she got bamboozled, um, that didn't work out for them. So hopefully, um, other people are seeing this. If you, if you, uh, if you know somebody who's a po politician or who's in law enforcement and they do Scientology's bidding, Hey, maybe say like, Hey, what's up with that? You know, maybe they can get some pressure. <laughs> I don't know how good that's going to do, but it is what it is. Um, okay. Max says, Mark, how do I tell my family that they are being duped? I have a lot of close family in. Oosh. So this is a rough one. Um, and, and really, um, they have a thing in Scientology and it's called good roads, fair weather or fair roads, good weather, one or the other. But, um, if you have a relative that you don't know if they're cool with Scientology or not outside of Scientology, then whenever you talk to them, you just say like, Hey, how's it going? Weather here has been amazing. Um, I, I did blah, blah the other day and I did this and they kind of, they don't talk about anything real serious or don't engage in anything so that you'll just have a conversation with them and let's not talk about Scientology because we already know Scientology is a heated subject. So it's hard unless your family are coming to visit you or, um, I'm not sure. I don't, I mean the, 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 if there's signs or, or you see that they're distressed or whatever, in, if they're in the C organization and you know, they're in the C organization, then I would just somehow let them know that if they ever wanted to go on vacation or they ever needed a place to stay, if they were traveling or anything like that, I would make sure that you let them know that they're always welcome and that they can come see you or stay with you and that um, and that you're there for them no matter what. Because a lot of Sea Org members, they don't know that. And even I didn't know that. When I escaped, I was hoping that my dad would take me in. I didn't even know that he would take me in. Of course, my dad was like, are you insane? Of course you can come stay with me and and to get away from that and I'll buy you a plane ticket and all this other stuff. But I didn't know that. I was 
I was leaving and hoping that that would be the case. And there's no way for a Sea Org members, depending on where they are, there's not really a good way for them to communicate with outside people because all the mail is being opened that's coming or going to anybody. So if you if they're writing a letter saying, hey, I'm going to ha- try to escape um, in, a, in a week from now, well, that's going to get intercepted and they ain't going to be doing any escaping. So um, I think that's what I would just say. I would just say, just make sure they know you're there for them. And if they do, uh, if they ever are in a situation where they need to go somebody, I would be, just ma- make sure they know your phone number and there's a way that and their, your address and there's a way for you to contact them somehow, no matter what. But I wouldn't say, don't say if you try to escape or you try to leave, just say if you ever go on vacation or you're traveling and you need a place to stay. That's what I would say. And maybe even don't word it like that because Osa's watching this thing and they're probably going to be looking out for, and don't write the letter tomorrow. If they get, you know, like 18 letters in the next week that all say the same damn thing, they're going to know you guys watched this video. So maybe wait a a little bit, depending on your last name, wait that many days or weeks in the goddamn alphabet, wherever your first name lands. So that all these letters aren't showing up all at the same time. (laughs) That would be so crazy if like 27 people all wrote letters and they all said the same damn thing. And those guys are going to be like, something's up. Okay, um, Alexander Boss, uh, Barnes Ross. Thank you. She's a frequent flyer. Mark, what was the average event budget? Uh, like, how much do they spend on an IS event production? They used to have lasers, etc. Yeah, we did pyro, we did lasers, we did flag bearers, dancers, musicians, rock concert type openings. We did all that kind of stuff. I would say an IAS event used to run anywhere from, it depends. I mean, when I was doing them in the 90s, they weren't as big as they are now. Um, and we weren't spending that much as much as they are now. But we would spend on an IAS event, I would say event like video, stage, uh, costumes, makeup, talent, musicians, I would say all in maybe anywhere from five hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars an event for an IAS event. Um, and that's getting all the crew to England, um, flights, all that. And that doesn't include David Miscavige. David Miscavige is going on a private jet or he's going in, in um, he's chartering a plane or whatever he's doing. And that's it's, that's a whole nother uh, um like an amount that comes out of a different bucket. And that could be a hundred to two thousand dollars just for his him and his crew um to get there and do whatever they're doing. Um and then um and in a lot of cases he'd take somebody like a private Scientologist, a public Scientologist, like a Craig Jensen, who was the found was the creator, founder of a company called Disc Keeper. Uh, or then another company called Executive. They had a product called Disc Keeper, and then they had a company called Executive Software. He'd use his jet or JT's jet or Tom's jet, or he'd use somebody's jet, or they'd just charter a plane. Um, and then I would say a New Year's event could be a million bucks, could anywhere be from a 500000 to a million dollars. And then an event like at the Fort Harrison, that could be like a 300000 to $500,000 event. Now, mind you, um, when we do these events, we're using a broadcast truck that was at a Super Bowl or an NFL game. So you have one of these semi trailers that's just filled with an audio editing thing and a video editing bay and a camera control center and a huge, uh, just all the millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment. These guys normally, they go to um, a football game. They get there the day before. They run all their cables. They get every all the cameras set up. They get all the audio stuff set up. They s- do all that. The next day, they have the game. They um, do all the live. You know when the, the those stats come up on the screen and the scoreboard and all that. That's all being done in a broadcast truck or in a broadcast room somewhere, and and uh, that alone could be. Two hundred thousand dollars, two three hundred thousand dollars for the truck and the people that work in the truck um, could easily be two three hundred thousand dollars. Just that one thing, just for video and audio for the truck, and that's the cameras that are the cameras are kind of part of the truck that they set up wherever in the Shrine Auditorium or at the Ruth Eckert Hall or whatever. And um, and then you have all you know stage. That's a that could be a hundred thousand dollars to build the whole stage. Um, 
and then dancers and lasers and pyro and all that stuff. So, um, and then the events like at the Fort Harrison, that could also be, they would, we would have a broadcast truck for that too. So behind the Fort Harrison, the auditorium. So if you, if you are driving between the superpower building and the Fort Harrison hotel, that's Fort Harrison street or Fort Harrison, whatever Avenue, whatever it is, road highway, the highway that's there. And then on the backside where the cabanas are, that is where the broadcast truck would park. And then we would run the cables from there up into the auditorium and then set up all the cameras they set up all those cameras and that whole broadcast truck for an event sometimes that we would do at the fort harrison uh, at the auditorium at the the flat fort harrison uh, hotel in clearwater so um and that so that could be three to four hundred thousand dollars for that event and that doesn't include that's the event now we're also producing all these videos for that event and that could be you know 30 to a hundred thousand dollars per video depending on if we're shooting at the studio at golden era productions or if it's a location shoot or if we got to send crews all over the world to video some dude that's doing something or we're going to go do Tom Cruise. That's another video I'm going to do. Is that Tom Cruise turtleneck video? There was two videos that David Miscavige had done before that video ended up being the video. And I'll tell the story of that. That's a whole nother crazy story. Um, okay. I think that's the good answer for that question. Okay. Um, Kyle Coden, Kyle, Kyle Cowden. I just saw Kirstie Alley on an old match game before she was done. Do you know if it was an exposure thing by Scientology? If it was an exposure, okay, if you don't know. No, Scientology um, got in, I think she got in through uh, John Travolta and drugs. She got in through Narconon. I think she had like, I think she used to do, I think there's an interview somewhere where she used to do like mountains of cocaine. And um, so Scientology, she thinks, or, or she did, Scientology helped her not do mountains of cocaine. And then she started doing other stuff. And then she ended up being the international spokesperson for Narconon. And, um, and actually, there's a story about that, too. I might do a video on that. And the guy that got her to give a $300,000 check and become the international spokesperson for Narconon was the guy who did all the voiceovers for the event. And his name was... Jeff Pomerantz, not Michael Pomerantz, Aaron, Jeff Pomerantz. And he would go, join us now as we bring you live. And he would do all the event voiceovers for all of those events that I just talked about. I think that answers that question pretty thoroughly. Um, Rocky Road, what do you think would happen if we love bombed the orgs, dropped off gift cards, order pizza, etc.? cetera? Um, I think it would be great. I mean, they probably could use that. It's probably a shit show up at that up up at that place. But um, I don't know. Mm, I don't know that that's really going to make a difference for getting people out. I know that we have these cards that we pass out for the um, for the Aftermath Foundation, if somebody wants to leave, it says, hey, if you need somewhere to go, you can call us, that sort of thing. And people put those in, around Scientology organizations where Sea Org members might find them or at the Subway or the Starbucks. And there's one gal that wanted to take a, an Aftermath card and stick it to a Burger King like gift card and give it to them. That's not a bad idea either. I mean, if there's if there's a Western bacon chi attached to, uh, to a, a gift card, I might remember that you know, or a, uh, whatever they got over it. I think it's Wendy's is actually what they have. I don't remember. It's a Wendy's. It's right around the corner from Scientology or Burger King, whatever. But um, yeah, maybe that might be a good thing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the love bombing. Um, do we know what COB's official salary is? Doesn't he get paid a buttload or is he the standard SOH? Oh no, that dude makes like a few hundred thousand dollars a year because he's the head of uh, our religious technology center and, and they're a nonprofit, but you can pay your nonprofits pay, you know, handsomely some nonprofits do. And, um, and who's going to tell him he can't. And, and for a while, Shelly was making that much too. And he was making so much more than other RT C C org members that, I, that for a while in the, in the night, in the eighties and the nineties, they were getting like 10 to $15,000 bonuses at the end of the year, just so they weren't getting two G's a year. And he was getting 400. So, um, they would get like 30,000 a year and he'd get 300. And it was like, okay, that's good. That's a good, that's a good ratio. Um, yeah. okay. 
Uh, Jen Fralick says, seems so shady to me. So much for being public servants. Yeah, no shit, Jen. Yeah, it's 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 insane. If you think about it, I was I literally I was sitting I was sitting there thinking I'm going. People keep asking why law enforcement. I'm always like, well, yeah, you know, they need there's so much burden of proof and they need so much. And I was like, oh yeah, what about the fact that we're spending millions of dollars on on police officers to be private investigators and um, private security? Oh, that could probably be a huge factor as well. Beth Doublekick Chick says, does the Aftermath Foundation help people who work for Scientology and want to escape as well? Um, absolutely. We'll help any, it's not only Sea Org members, we've helped um, just people that were just in Scientology as members. And they, you know, w basically what happens is you have a person in Scientology, whether a Sea Org member, a staff member, or a public Scientologist, um, depending on how long they've been in and, and how they got in, their entire world could be involved in Scientology. Their entire family, their entire workforce, their entire um, company, um, anybody and everybody that they're connected to could be involved in Scientology. And if they don't, and, and there's people that want to leave because they cannot stand the criminality that's happening and they don't want to be even associated with it and they want to leave or something horrible has happened to them or Scientology are just being full-time pricks to them. Any one of those things that could happen, but if they leave and they make a stink, they're not going to be able to talk to their family. And if they don't care about that part and they're like, I don't care about that part, I just want to leave, then we can help them leave and get a new job, get a place to stay, get a car, get an apartment for a few months, whatever they need to kind of get their feet on the ground so they can start their life over because they don't really have any infrastructure or support system to, 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 to help them now that they're basically abandoning their life. Those are the people that the Aftermath Foundation are there to help. Hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, I know you escaped on your motorcycle. I was just wondering what was your what was the final straw that opened your eyes to want to blow from Scientology? Okay, so obviously I've covered this um, in detail in my book, Blown for Good: Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. But essentially, they w said that I was going to go to the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is kind of like the gulags in Scientology. It's a it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a reprogramming camp that you go to and it's a shit show and I didn't want to go there and I would rather be dead than go there and I didn't care if my wife was still there or my family were in Scientology I wasn't going to go to no Scientology gulag and I already had enough after being there for 15 years and I would basically rather be dead than stay there and I didn't want to commit suicide so I decided I should escape and that is how my book starts and then you find out from there um Stephen Britton says, uh, this is a super chat to help you fix your motorcycle. I sold that motorcycle to Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, and I bought the exact same motorcycle all over again that had not been crashed, and it looks amazing, and I still ride it. I rode it a few months ago. It's parked right outside my house. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Um, I'll put some gas in it. I'll fill the tank up with that. Um, okay, Nana, Yo Nana Yor Yorbins. Um, I'm a broke, I'm a broker, mm. I'm a broker than a Scientologist, then a Scientologist, so I can't super question you, sorry. I'm not sure what that means, but okay, don't worry. Um, Claire, what, what, what's up with the stars? That, is that, was that a super chat? I'm not sure why that one was started. That one was super rando. Okay. Um, Marjan, uh, Kai Kavusi. I'm sending you a link for a musician for your channel. Why, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I actually um, <laughs> actually hire a lot of ex-Scientologists to help me with things. So the guy that, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but the guy that did the music for my channel, um, he actually was in a, a hit 70s rock band called People. And he was a Scientology um, musician and a very, very... Uh, longtime professional musician, and his name is Jeff Levin. And he's the one who made the intro and outro music for my channel. And um, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. And a lot of people love it. But um, I'll take it. I'll, if somebody's got music for me, I'll use it for something. 
Johnny Violet, I'm doing a school project and contacting current Scientologists. What are the best questions I should ask to troll them? You know, Johnny, um, I would love to troll Scientologists, um, but they're not really, I mean, most Scientologists are good people that are trying to do good for the planet, even though they're um, disillusioned and um, kind of silly on not thinking, not like asking questions about some of the stuff that they're up to. Um, so I'm not really the biggest fan, although it sounds fun, I'm not the biggest fan of trolling Scientologists because um, it kind of just, it, it, I think um, it could go one of two ways. It could lead them to the internet to, to look at something, but it could also kind of steal up their bubble to not look outside of the bubble so you got to be careful with that i i think a lot of times to the way i found a really good way to kind of break through that is to not talk shit not try to troll them but maybe ask questions like math questions like how have you not cleared clear water in 50 years um like if you can't clear clear water you ain't clearing the planet so like those t sort of things that would make them think like, yeah, why haven't we cleared clear water or why haven't we cleared little Armenia, which is like right around this giant Scientology complex in Hollywood. Um, they can't clear a zip code. How are they going to clear the planet? All Scientologists, their overriding thing is kind of like we're supposed to clear the planet. And um, well, what's happening? My lights are freaking out in here. I think the whole rest of the house might have lost power, but my uh, my stuff's on UPS is down here, so I don't know. Something's weird. Something's going funky. Um, it's uh, it's Osa. It's trying to get up in here, get on my lights. Catherine S. Question might be too late. How did you feel about them now? How do you feel then and now about the term wog? I never really knew that that was a big deal. A wog is just somebody who's not a Scientologist. That's it. It's, you call them wogs. It's like, um, I'm trying to think of another thing. It's like when um, whatever the, the there's, I think um, Jewish people have a word for, it's, I think it's called goy. Um, I should know this. I, I watch, uh, there's a guy on uh, YouTube I watch called Ari Shafir, but I think it's called goys. I think they're called goys. And if you're in that, if you're in there and you, you that everybody knows what a goy is, that's, um, that's Scientology's goy. They just call wogs wogs. And it's like, um, it's in Harry Potter. What do they call them? Uh, mud, mud, muggles or mudbloods or some shit <laughs> or, uh, I think it's muggles, right? I don't know. It's the same thing. It's a muggle. Uh, Non-Scientologists are muggles. They're, they're wogs, man. Um, and whenever, like, even if, like, you were going to report somebody, you're going to, like, oh, you're going to go to wog. You're going to avail yourself of the wog justice system? Um, Stephen Britton, was all IAS music composed and recorded in-house? Yes, the Golden Era musicians are the ones that do all of the scoring, recording, mixing for all projects, video. Well, now they do. They probably do it at Scientology Media Productions because they have Mad Hatter Studios in Los Angeles right near there. But um, Golden Era used to do it. Now they probably do it at Scientology Media Productions. But those are also Scientology musicians also play at these events. So if there's a live band... It's the, if you go to England, it's the Jive Aces. And sometimes they use the Jive Aces. They're like a, um, they're like a Scientology stray cats. And um, they do like, uh, I don't know what that swing music, I think it's called. Big band swing music. Um, and then they have Scientology Media Productions and they have the Golden Air Musicians. So yeah, that's all done in house. And they usually are people that get their asses kicked by David Miscavige. He micromanages all that kind of stuff. When I was there, he did. How can I get my mom and sisters the knowledge to wake up from the scam Scientology is uh, my mom is OT7. One of my sisters is clear and the other is trying to get clear. Please read Josh Steiner, Joshua Steiner. Um, like I said, Josh, you got to be really careful because it's either because if you go too hard, then they're never going to talk to you again. And if you don't do anything, then they might just keep going. So you got to just tell them, um, I don't know, man, you got to tell them um, you're there for them. 
Um, you can always, always pick up kind of like signals, like you can ask them how much they're spending and this and that and the other thing. Um, telling them how good you're doing and how good your life is without Scientology is also sometimes effective. Like a Scientologist, most Scientologists are spending every waking minute trying to make money for Scientology or they're giving a lot of their money to Scientology. And if you're doing well and you're successful and you're not spending any money on Scientology, it's sort of like, what am I doing giving all my dough to these guys? Maybe invite them on vacations, um, those sort of things so they can see how um, amazing the world is outside of the Scientology bubble. Um, that's the best I can, um, suggest you can also go, sometimes you could go on forums. I think, um, on Reddit, there's people there that'll an answer. You could go to face, there's Facebook groups, the, um, supporters of the aftermath, uh, Liam Remini and the aftermath on Facebook. There's Facebook, second generation Scientology, Facebook groups, you, uh, groups you can join, um, or ask questions to, um, that's what, that's what I'd say. Um, Okay. Here we go. Um, Holiday Arnett. Hey, Mark and Claire. I got my autograph book yesterday. I'm so excited to read it. Waiting on Mike's signed book to show up soon. Awesome. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, we got here. We got another one. Um, Joyce Gray. I'm just looking to make sure I'm not going too crazy here on time. Um, Joyce Gray. Uh, please help Chris and Aaron settle their nonsense. We love all of you. I'm pretty sure that Aaron and Chris could settle their on their nonsense if they just got on the phone. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think. Um, I I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure about all the behind the scenes between all those guys. But um, I try to stay out of that stuff. Um, I'm doing my thing, and um, if I can help, and if I can you know, talk to them than I do, but uh, then they, none of them have reached out to me about it. So I just let, I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm not a professional mediator, but, um, I've already talked to a bunch of these guys anyway. And I always, am like, you know, just, just focus on the, uh, the matters at hand. Let's try to not do the infighting. Infighting is a big thing that, um, that uh, Office of Special Affairs likes to stir up amongst critics or ex-Scientologists to, to make it so that they fight each other and not Scientology. So I know that's part of their playbook, so I usually try not to engage if possible. Um, but, you know, sometimes personalities clash, and it is, it's just like anything in life. Sometimes you just people just like to get into it with each other. Um, Rick Elkins, thank you. Very, very generous of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Anthony Spurgeon. Hey, Anthony. Uh, good to see you again. here again. Are you expected to like Hubbard's fiction? Yeah. In some cases they make you buy that shit too. So, um, I remember, um, L. Ron Hubbard, they were doing a whole big thing. Author services in Los Angeles, which is L. Ron Hubbard's literary agent was doing this big campaign to release all these dumbass stories he did, um, when he was doing pulp fiction in like the, I want to say like in the forties, 30s and 40s he was writing for like like little short stories and they were they were getting artists or writers to kind of flush out the stories and into full things and so they had like i pedrito and um uh, buckskin brigades and all these westerns and all these silly books fear and final final blackout is that one of them as well I think it is anyway. And, and staff were being encouraged to spend, buy these things and you have to, you know, 15 bucks, you're getting paid 45 bucks a week, 45 bucks. That's a third of your pay on some dumb book. You don't want to read anyway. Um, yeah, that was a bummer. Thanks for reminding me, Anthony. Appreciate it. Um, okay. No, it's all good. I'm just messing with you. Okay. Um, so it is seven, it's seven Oh eight right now. I'm going to answer. I'm going to go for like another, I'm going to go to seven thirty. So if Claire is still around, if you can, um, star some, uh, some more questions, um, but still ones that were in there before. Um, but, um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any more super chats, but I'll do other questions that were in there. Um, I just I didn't want I don't like having to rush to do the super chats and I get all stressed out and then I I don't just tell the stories that I'm trying to tell I get all freaked out about um, freaked out about making sure I do all the uh, super chats that people did will the migrants bust to LA from Texas be let off in front of the Fort Harrison well the Fort Harrison is in Clearwater um, 
Safinde Green. So they could get um, bust if they get if they do get bust to Los Angeles from Texas. They could be let off in front of um, the Big Blue, which is the giant uh, Scientology complex um, right off of Sunset and uh, and uh, Edgemont and near Fountain. Um, um, my TV says yes, it's Muggles in Harry Potter. Yeah, so Scientologists consider all non. Scientologists basically muggles and they look down. Oh, 100% Scientology look down at wogs. If you are a um, Scientologist, you know that you're smarter, you're, uh, you're, you have more powers, you have more abilities, you're like a better human than a wog. That's 100%. Um, Karma Cham's Kitten says Ron's book details the musical micromanagement of uh, Mikivich. Yeah, Miscavige. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And it's funny. I've been saying it for years that the guy micromanaged and not because of his size, just because he micromanages. Even though he is micro, he also micromanages. Um, I never made that connection until just recently. Um, I think it was, it might even have been a, somebody who did a, uh, a comment in here. Monica unknown says I went to a few swing dances when the jive aces were the band. I didn't know at the time that they were Scientologists. Yeah. Not only are the jive aces Scientologists, they're Sea Org members, they're billion year contract signers, the jive aces. They were a swing band in England that was doing all these Scientology events. And David Miscavige said, you guys need to join the Sea Org. And I think that maybe one of them didn't want to go. And they were like, well, you're not in the jive aces anymore. And all the ones that stayed, uh, that joined the Sea Org stayed in the jive aces. Crazy time. Let me have a sip here quick. Okay. Let's see what Claire did. Oh, there she goes. She uh, starts them up for me. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Brian S. says, that's my wife, Claire, for anybody who doesn't know. She's in the back of the uh, computers somewhere starring the questions you guys are asking. Brian S. says, how has the turnover affect employee morale and production? Um, I'm pretty sure that it's, it can't be good because they're always trying in Scientology. If, if you are a widget maker in Scientology and you made five midget, uh, widgets Last week, you're going to make six widgets this week and seven widgets next week. And it goes on and you can never make less. And when people leave and you needed four people to make 20 widgets a week and now you have three people, well, everybody's got to make a bunch of extra widgets in order to get. And it just keeps going and going and going. And um, so, yeah, that sucks. Sorry, guys. But, uh, yeah, you got to uh, you got to get out of there. Um. Okay. Uh, Anthony Spurgeon says, what is even on OTA? Does it still said, say Hubbard is Lucifer? I don't, I don't remember what's on OTA. When I left, when I escaped from Scientology, I had never done any OT levels. I didn't know about any of that Z news stuff. I didn't know about any of that craziness, body thetans and volcanoes. I didn't know any of that. So when I watched the South Park episode and I, and I was like watching it going like, yeah, this is, this is silly. You know, this is, this is really, really crazy. And then I asked Claire, my wife, who was like OT5, so past the Xenu thing. And I said, is this for real? And she was like, yeah, basically, that's pretty much it. And I was like, what? Anyway, right after that, I read everything from clear to all the way up to OT8 on the internet. Everything. I read it all. And, and again, after I watched the South Park thing, I thought, oh, I'm going to die now. They say if you find out about OT3, um, OT level three, before you're ready for it, that you will get pneumonia and you will die. And uh, so then the, I watched the South Park thing and I literally remembered like s sitting there, like laying awake at night thinking, what's going to happen to me? This is right after um, I had escaped from Scientology. Been there my whole life and been in the Sea Org for 15 years. Um, at the international headquarters. When I woke up the next morning and I didn't even have a sniffle, it was like I was I was done right then. I was like, I get it. It's basically it's the whole thing is a scam. <laughs> and then that's when I read all the way up to OT8. So I don't remember about the Lucifer thing if that's on the the old one or the new one or whatever. But there's a bunch of nonsense. All everything from clear to OT8, it's all nonsense. Everything's nonsense. 
Um, it doesn't do anything. It's a constant bait and switch. For, for people that are in Scientology that are watching this, the clear cognition is, and the, people are like literally, oh, jumping for the mute button. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, exit out. The clear cognition, when you do anything in Scientologist, in order to complete that thing, you have to have what's called a cognition or, or a realization. And it's, it's pretty much an exactly worded thing. And if you say anything that sort of resembles that thing, you have completed that thing. And the clear cognition is that you create it. You, when you do Dianetics, you, you learn about these things called engrams. And you learn that engrams are affecting you and your decisions. And there are these unconscious memories that you have that are affecting what you're doing in life right now. And you don't know. It's like subconsciously affecting your actions and your behaviors. And when you get auditing in Scientology and you become clear of your engrams, it's when you realize that you created your reactive mind, which stores all these engrams, and that you no longer are effect of your reactive mind. I just saved you $50,000 that you don't have to spend to get to the state of clear right now. So, and then, and then basically as you go up from clear to OT one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight, they're constantly kind of switching around these things that you're supposed to realize. And what you do when you do these Scientology training and these counseling is you build a house of cards around yourself and, and around your mind and your way of thinking you build they help you build a house of cards around that and how you live your life. And then they tell you how to take apart the house of cards as you get further and further up. But they're the ones that helped you build the house of cards. So you could literally get into Scientology tomorrow because you have a problem with relationships and they have a course on how to help you with a relationship and that's going to cost you a hundred and fifty dollars and 30 years from now and after you're getting through your third divorce and you are shit at relationships and but you're ot8 now and you've spent three million dollars um and you suck at relationships and then you realize that was a giant waste of time so maybe we'll go through, I think um, Tony Ortega on his site, there's a series called Up the Bridge with Claire, my wife, Claire Headley, and Bruce Hines did this series. And they basically explain every single step of any Scientology counseling or training that you can do and what it's supposed to do and what you're supposed to feel and all that good stuff if you get really excited about that nonsense. But um, truly is a bunch of nonsense it's not even worth really reading unless you just love um just nonsense mark is gold now defunct with smp doing all the av stuff pretty much as far as i heard the last i heard is that they're literally doing make work at the international headquarters for management and golden air productions they're all just cleaning old film negatives like taking microscopes and taking dust wiping dust off film negatives like just who cares? Why do you even need to do that? That's what they're doing. Um, Blum for good. Why would Scientology have the main Narconon in Oklahoma, but not a mission or org? Because Narconon is not part of Scientology. It is a front group that's under the Association of Better Living and Education in Los Angeles, which is their kind of like social betterment corpor corporation roundup front group that keeps track of all these guys. And also because um, I think for a while, the Narconon flagship in Oklahoma, it was it's a place called Narconon Arrowhead. It's on an Indian reservation. So there was a lot of things they got around, like regulations and rules because it was on the reservation. They really didn't have to answer to state and local officials. And they were kind of like doing their own thing. And before it was Narconon Arrowhead, it was Narconon Shalaka, which is also in Oklahoma. And finally, the Indians had enough of their bullshit and they threw them the hell out of there. And, um, and then they ended up in Arrowhead and they found some other Indians that were cool with them or they gave them some money or I don't know what, I don't know how that exactly went down. Um, that's a whole, but there's a whole bunch of stories about Narconon that I was involved in. Cause I used to work before I worked at the international headquarters, I worked at Abel. So I know all kinds of crazy Narconon and Criminon and other stories, which that is a whole nother thing. I should probably do some videos on like the people that ran Criminon. Criminon is like a, you do these extension courses in prison. Okay. 
in prison. So you have Sea Org members running an organization and managing it and fundraising for an organization that basically sends extension courses to prisoners. People in prison for crimes are doing Scientology courses. And if they had a rock star, a criminal rock star in prison, almost nine times out of 10, that dude would get out of prison and go to work for Criminon. And for when I was at ABLE, the dude that was the executive director of Criminon International was a really, really crazy, shady ex-prisoner. And I got some stories about that. And I'm sure a lot of people could send in stories. If you got Criminon stories, send them in. I'll talk about them. Um, but yeah. That's uh, that's some wild, wild stuff. Not Zelda one. Does Wong stand for anything in particular? I think it's another th um, term that um, Hubbard stole from the Navy, and I think it's a worldly, worldly Oriental gentleman or something like that. I think it's a British slash kind of Navy term, um, or it might just be a British term. But it's basically he stole it from somewhere. People know what Wong's a wealthy Oriental gentleman is. What I'm being texted and uh or world um thank you um okay um yeah claire after i read these un uncheck them if you can nika what happened to the sea org members that are too old to work or sick they usually let them die in convalescent homes and um abuse them they um this has been a thing and i'm pretty sure this is going to come out sooner or later but i'm going to just tell you right now um scientology are are uh, jacking up their elderly people they're um they're setting up credit cards um in their names and they're stealing um tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars from them and then they're having their social security payments pay the interest on these credit card bills and then when they die they die and scientology keeps all the money and then the credit card writes off the person and yeah so that's how they do that and so it's a system they have and they do it and um Graham Barry and other lawyers are helping some of these people that have had this happen to them but there's there's news stories out there about them doing it but they're they're still doing it it's a it's not a uncommon for them to do this so yeah they work them their whole lives until they're too old to work and then they steal their money and set them up in a sh a really shitty convalescent home somewhere to die hope that answered that question um, what facility or physician recommended early on that LRH be committed for mental illness? Has anyone tried to get those records? I've never heard of that. I don't know anything about that. I know that the doctor that was um, uh, treating L. Ron Hubbard was a Scientologist, and he was prescribing him um, psychiatric drugs, but he was not um, – he didn't – I don't think he said that he needed to be committed. Um, I don't know who said that. I, I don't know what that I don't know what that's referencing. Um, is it Shelly's birthday? Does she even know it's her birthday? She definitely knows it's her birthday, Beth Double Kick Chick. Um, and I think her birthday is tomorrow. Um, that's the uh, word on the street. It's either today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, she knows when her birthday is. Um, the wrong tube question when the staff Sea Org are interviewed in Scientology produced videos, they're identified in on screen graphics by job title only, never the names. Why is this? So no one can fact che check it. <laughs> um, and also, um, a lot of times like, um, a, the, when I was at the, um, when I was at golden era, um, we shot tons of films and one of the, uh, at the end base, L Ron Hubbard wrote a policy for anybody who worked at the end base, um, that you basically had to pe appear as an actor in anything that you were selected for. If you were cast, you had to appear, you had to be that person. And mostly people just did, um, like background and stuff like that. And then we use Scientology actors for the main parts, but in almost all cases, they had to redo Scientology videos and films because the people, the staff in the films either escaped or the Scientology actors escaped or like every single film that I shot when I was there and I shot a ton of videos and I shot a ton of films, every single one of them has SPs in it now that they've had to redo every single one and it finally got to a point where they just won't have any Scientologists in their movies and they don't try to get those people into their movies because they will eventually get into Scientology and then leave Scientology and likely talk shit about Scientology and then Scientology will have to redo that video or film so 
they definitely try not to name them if they can, because then if it's not a really well-known SP, then you might not know it who's. But if it says, oh, Mark Headley said blah, 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 they're going to be like, oh, I heard of that guy. He's got a YouTube channel. He, don't, he talks a lot of shit about Scientology now. Okay. Um, do staff members in DMs Orbit get special perks? They do, Jamie, for real. Um, uh, they, like in my case, I, for some times, I was kind of in DMs Orbit for a little bit, and he bought me this really cool watch. It was called a... Um, an Oakley GMT and he was going to get one of his own staff were going to get was going to get this watch and I don't know I did something that was pretty awesome that got his attention and he asked um the the like the lady who handles gifts and stuff for his office um she was told to ask me what I wanted for Christmas or my birthday or something and um and I really I saw this watch somewhere somehow I don't even remember how but I was like I want an Oakley GMT watch and the guy it was he was actually like one of Dave's assistants that worked with him and um his name was Elon Elon Baram and Elon had said that he wanted that same watch so they'd already bought the watch and so then when I said I wanted that watch they already had it. They just gave it to me. <laughs> and then Elon, when he saw me wearing it, he was like, you fucker, you took my watch. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And then somebody told me the story. Yeah, he asked for that watch. That's how they they just happened to already have it because he was going to get it. Anyway, so I got a watch. And I also got a cell phone. I think those are the two things I want to say that I got from Dave. Um, there's people that have gotten cars. Like, I know a guy who got a Mini Cooper. Um, so I got a watch and a cell phone. Not really in the overall scheme of things, but yeah, you get perks sometimes, but when you got, when you were in trouble, you got the, you got the far end of the trouble too. So it, it, uh, that, uh, I don't remember. I don't know the saying that, uh, that, that ship goes both ways or whatever it is that, that swings both ways. Um, okay. Next question. Uh, Stacy, thank you. Got my bobblehead. Thanks for all you and Claire do. Why, thank you, Stacy. I appreciate it. We are literally sliding in right in time here. Anon says, um, did you ever meet Soleil Moonfry at either Apple School or Delphi? I did meet her at Apple School. Um, Soleil Moonfry um, was a child actor on a TV show called Punky Brewster in the 1980s. And she went, she, she was a I guess her parents were Scientologists. I never really met the parents. I only met her and her brother's name was um, Mino Palouse. And Mino Palouse was in a show. I think it was called The Adventures or The Explorers. I don't remember the name of the show, but it was like him and this other dude like time traveled or something. And um, and that guy ended up getting killed by I think a bullet went into his head when a, a, a prop gun went off and killed him. Um, I can't remember his name. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, but yeah, Soleil Moonfry. And, you know, I even got into an argument with the next Scientologist because s supposedly Soleil Moonfry then ended up going, she used to go to Apple school, but then she ended up going to Delphi, which is another school that I went to, but she went after she turned 14 and they had a policy at Delphi that you couldn't really start going there if you started after you were 14 years old. And some, I guess they made an exception for her because she was a child actress, but um, I'm not sure that they have anything to do with Scientology anymore. I don't know. I know that Mino was very good friends with Lisa Marie Presley. Lisa Marie Presley hung out and I think she went to Del uh, Apple school for a while and she hung out with a ton of the guys there and like... Um, she was also in with a lot of a lot of people that went to Apple School in Los Angeles ended up going to Delphi in Los Angeles when Apple School, the people that ran Apple School um, had a falling out with Scientology and they got declared suppressives. And then um, so a lot of the kids that were in Scientology, they went to Apple School, then had to go to Delphi, Oregon or Delphi, Los Angeles. And Lisa Marie, I know um, her. Um, first husband, Danny Keogh, I think he, him and his brother Thad both went to Delphi. I don't know if they went to, um, I don't know if the Keoghs went to Apple school before they went to Delphi, but, um, but either way, um, there's Adam Hancock and, um, the Alcox and, um, the Keoghs and, uh, Soleil Moonfry and Mino Palouse. These guys were all kind of, everybody knew everybody. And, um, a lot of people were good friends, a lot of people that went to Delphi then ended or Apple School ended up in the C organization in Scientology and like Sky Dayton um, used to go to Apple School and then he went to 
um, Delphi, Oregon. And then he became, um, he started Earthlink, the internet company, Earthlink. Um, and that's part of the story that I'm going to tell you. Um, that's a Scientology on Scientology crime. But um, yeah. Okay. Two more questions, then we're done. Okay. Um, thank you, Anon. Okay. Tamara, Mark, share the story about the dude that got kicked out of the base for his daydreaming about pleasuring Dave. Okay. So um, this will be the last one then. Um, okay. So um, there was a guy we were in a, we were in a meeting with L. Ron, uh, with L. Ron Hubbard, with David Miscavige. And um, I can't remember what it was for. Something that had to do with marketing. And there was this guy that from marketing that was there in the meeting. And um, so he did something or he said something and got Dave's attention. And Dave said, hey, you got to pull that guy in. He's got something going on. And I was actually roommates with this guy. My, Claire and myself lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And the other, in the other apartment was this guy and his wife. And his wife was one of the feshback guys. Um, daughters who was a uh, daughter of these wealthy um, Scientology um, Scientologists that w- had given millions and millions and millions of dollars to Scientology. And um, so he was married to one of those girls and they were our roommates. Anyway, um, he got hauled off and he got interviewed. And basically, he confessed in an interview that he was daydreaming of um, David Miscavige servicing him under the table. And um, and they were like, okay. And um, they ended off the interview. They packed all his stuff. And like within 45 minutes after the interview was over, he was gone. He was off the property, never to be seen or heard from again. <laughs> and um, and this dude was the most hetero dude <laughs> you could know. So I don't think he really, I mean, whether he, he was really daydreaming about that or not, it was a genius because as soon as they found out, as soon as Dave found out that that dude was thinking about that. That dude was never going to be seen by Dave ever again in the, for the rest of Dave Miscavige's life. And then that's exactly what happened. And, and as, a, as a result, that guy didn't have to deal with any more Dave's nonsense. So on that, we are going to go through uh, some housekeeping here. So we got um, bobbleheads and SP bracelets. Um, Currently, the plan is that when we run out of these bracelets and when we run out of these bobbleheads, we're going to switch over to a whole different kind of merch. And Claire is not going to be running around packing up bobbleheads and um, bracelets anymore. We're going to sell T-shirts and mugs and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to have a fulfillment company do it. So if you want a bracelet or you want a Mike Render bobblehead, um, I would suggest getting it now because I'm not sure that we're going to order any more of these things. Maybe we will, but I am leaning in the direction of not. So if you want a Mike Rinder bobblehead or you want an SP bracelet, which the proceeds support the Aftermath Foundation, go to the spshop.com. If you want to support the Aftermath Foundation directly, you can just go to the aftermathfoundation.org. Um, and you can also go to Amazon and set up an Amazon Smile profile that automatically donates a certain per- purchase a portion of your purchases just automatically goes to the Aftermath Foundation. We do get a few thousand bucks a month from that, um, from people doing that. Um, so it adds up. More people do it. It could be like 50 cents here, 20 cents here, 18 cents here. But when you got a few thousand people, people doing it. it it adds up and that helps people get out of scientology uh people that are getting out of scientology or the c organization organization it helps us uh get them back on their feet um if you uh if you want to get a blown for a good book um all copies um sold through blownforgood.com are signed by myself and my wife and lastly do not forget to subscribe i'm trying to get more than eighty thousand subscribers for L. Ron Hubbard's birthday because I'm playing the birthday game and I'm playing against Scientology's YouTube channel. So in order for me to win the birthday game and give L. Ron Hubbard a present of all these new subscribers, I got to get over 80,000. Um, I'm going to do a double check right now. Let's see where we're at. I'm going to pull it up. I got a tally here. I'm going to pull it up. I think we were we were we were getting around nineteen thousand. We are at eighteen thousand seven sixty nine. I should have started by saying that, and this whole time we could have been getting up to nineteen thousand. Missed opportunity, Mark. Um, if you're watching this video right now and you're not subscribed, just subscribe. It's free. It's fun. It's it's easy. It's a click. 
You just click subscribe. And right now I'm at 18,769. So basically I need like literally 250 more subscribers and I'm going to get over 19,000. Every time we tick over a uh, an extra thousand subscribers, we give away a Blum for Good hardback, paperback, or audible. If you want one of those, get in the comments, subscribe, get in the comments and say, I want one of those, whichever one you want. And Claire just randomly picks one. Every time we hit a thousand, uh, the next thousand subscribers, she emails the person or says, Hey, you won. You send me an email on the about page saying, Hey, Claire said I won. And then we send you one. People getting them every week. We've sent out 19, 20 books so far. People give me good ideas in the comments. I send them a book. Um, people uh, get picked randomly by Claire. We send them a book or a bobblehead or I mean or bobble not a bobblehead a book an audible. We give I get I can even send you an audible code and you can just download the um, audible book for Blown for Good the audible book for free. So subscribe. Please subscribe. And um, yeah, I want to get more subscribers than Scientology has. How insane would that be? I mean, I started this channel like a month ago. How crazy would it be that by March 13th, just a few months, I could get more subscribers than Scientology's YouTube channel, which is also well over how many actual members there are in Scientology. Um, and then we can kind of prove how tiny and ineffective Scientology is um, that we can do that in such a short amount of time. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for all you guys that uh, stuck in here the whole time. Um, I'm going to try to do um, at least two or three more videos um, before the end of the weekend um, this week. Um, there's a ton of other videos on the channel you guys can tune into. There's even a list of uh, websites that David Miscavige has set up. Um, a ton of crazy hate websites they have set up on myself and my wife and a bunch of other of us that um, expose Scientology uh, every now and again. And um, I've got videos of all the websites that they've like they have hundreds and thousands of websites set up about us ex members that are talking smack about them. They have websites and domain names and all this stuff set up. And if you haven't seen this, you could go over there, put it on. I would recommend putting it on maybe half speed or if there's a quarter like three quarter speed because they go by pretty fast. I read some of them. They're insane crazy. Um, yep, that's it. Until next time, guys. Thank you very much. And outro.